Okay, hello, I'm back. This is actually Saturday evening, um, around uh, 9.30 in the evening, because I'm doing a bunch of stuff tomorrow, uh, Sunday, so I not, was afraid I wouldn't get to it. Uh, so we're going, we're moving on to the balcony, and so I'm going to be building a segue from Waiting for Godot to the balcony, and as usual, the headlines and current events are supplying me with uh, fresh material. Uh, I've been re looking over how the conspiracy theory th that united QAnon uh, came about. And let me walk you through it because it's, it's very similar to the balcony. But before I do that, uh, uh, let me show you how I see the two are connected. I, Waiting for Godot is a bare stage, just all there is is a tree. The balcony has excessive props uh, and gigantic props. The mise-en-scene or the scene is uh, very elaborate. Um, so you'd think they're rather different plays, but it seems that when you have no props and when you have an excess of props, you can still draw attention to the same thing, that behind the absence of props, behind the excess of props, is something like the void. So there's the void uh, of the real. And we impose a pattern on the void of the real, which makes it seem like something else. And we call it reality. Now, the, the, in the classical age, reality was seen to be what actually is, is real. And, and if you sin, you could be cast into the void or you could go to hell. So for the, for the, for the religious age, for the age of faith, the, the chaos and void behind the, the reality that God had given you was, was hell. Uh, it postmodernism, to a certain extent, has wound up flipping that and saying that, well, actually, it, life is hell, and then we seek a respite from it by imposing uh, a, a, an illusion of reality upon it. And we all do this. It's, nobody's deluded in doing this. And the, the question <clears throat> becomes not, do you impose a pattern that you misrecognize as a reality in order to buffer yourself from the terror of the void? Yeah, you do. We all do. What's the quality of, your, uh, of, of the re representation that you impose on the void? There's quite a difference, I would like to think, between the reality that I impose on the void and the reality imposed on the void by someone by a group like QAnon, um, because the reality they, or even what Vladimir and Estragon are trying to do, or the or the fake bishop and and uh, the fake general, that is, they are creating an extremely unstable reality that is so narrow. Uh, Trump will return. Trump will solve everything. Trump will expose that all Democrats are pedophiles, possibly originally to people, uh, on and on. It doesn't matter how insane the, the content of the conspiracy theory is. What matters is that, it's a, is that it operates as a not yet and that it promises to expose the reality behind the, the presence of the void. Um, so when you have a very narrow projection onto the void of what reality is, uh, you are a very volatile subject because how you what you project onto the void as your reality positions you in relation to the void. There's a moment in Waiting for Godot where uh, Estragon says, where did you sleep last night? Uh, and he says, here, there, what difference does it make? There's no lack of a void. And Beck, as you know, had said about his own writing that the, the trick is to, pre is to present the chaos as it is and not pretend it's something else. Um, in a way, QAnon was pretending that the chaos of their own lives was something else. And what, one of the things that is seductive about conspiracy theories is it takes the problems you feel in yourself out of yourself. Um, this is, this, this is, can be behind racism, misogyny, anti-Semitism. You know, you don't, you stop addressing what choices have you made that have created the position that has you feeling the way you feel. And if the conspiracy theories 
effective enough. You didn't do anything. It was it, it's the Jews who control everything, or it's women who use their sexuality to distort and manipulate. This is what the group, the incels, managed to dream up for themselves. Is that the reason they were celibate, involuntarily celibate, um, is that women weren't offering to lie down for them. It had nothing to do with them. Uh, women were refusing to make themselves available, uh, and therefore the women were performing an act of aggression on the involuntarily celibate. Starts to sound just as wacky when you, you know, take it apart. But the thing it has in common is that you don't have to take any responsibility. I mean, if you want to be celibate and you are, fine. And if you don't want to be, and you still are, then what are you going to do about it? Um, or not do about it, or what are you doing that's not working? As opposed to it's that that woman <laughs> that I just met in uh, in Starbucks. It's her fault uh, because she saw me here and, and she didn't offer to, to spend the night with me. Um, so it looks kind of it, it starts to sound comically crazy, but you, it's important to see that we because we all do it to an extent. We're not, not all nuts like that. But we all, to a certain extent, have to buffer ourselves from the overwhelming terror that it doesn't matter where we are, and we don't know who we are, we don't know when we are, and we don't know why we are, because there is no lack of void. And and the characters in Godot sort of trade off. Like Pozo is very good at positioning everybody in Act One, but then he's blind and has no position in Act Two. Lucky tries to create a subject position. Uh, you know, in spite of the tennis and the stones and Connemar, and when they can't stand it anymore, when, when they, uh, you know, rush for his hat so they'll stop thinking, you know, why is, why, why do they literally seem in pain listening to Lucky? And that's because he's not pretending the chaos is something else. He's in it and he can't get out of it. And it terrifies them because he, he's starting to remind them that the only reason they're not in the chaos that Lucky is, is squirming around in, remember he does this weird dance that he calls the net. Um, most of us have a safety net and he, Lucky doesn't anymore. Uh, so they have to stop Lucky because he's making them too aware of that, that they're suspended over the void as well. Subjectivity is, is the bridge that allows you to stay suspended above the void. But subjectivity isn't, that's not yourself or even your self-construction. Subjectivity is how you feel in relation to other people. And, uh, and how you feel in relation to other people is the source of your, whether or not, whether you feel subjected to power or whether you are able to um, subject others to your power. Like, Power, and this is the most important line in my lecture on the balcony, power is an effect of relationship. There's no such thing as power. Power is generated by subjectivity. Subjectivity is generated by our, by our relation to others. So uh, a child seems to be um, subject to the power of parents, not because they have some power that, that, uh, that they bought somewhere, but it's it's the subjectivity. The child is dependent. The child is younger. The child wants to be loved, uh, wants to be loving. All of this gives the parents certain power, and power itself is is not good or bad. Um, it's how you leverage it, and we all know this that that uh, you know somebody a professor having an affair with a student let's make a really obvious example is it is it abuse of power it doesn't matter if the student's fine with it. it doesn't matter if the professor's single or if they're both single or even if they get engaged and it happens but it's still it's when you look at the dynamics you're there is a different there's a power differential there um this is why the whole issue of consent is is so tricky that Somebody who have power over might consent to spend the night, but that's not consent because they're afraid to say no. And then this, this, that's different. You can't simply say, well, you went on with them, so you said yes. Um, where there is a power differential, and the law kind of, you know, recognizes this. So certainly a 30-year-old with a 15-year-old is going to be statutory rape, um, and, uh, or, and a priest with it. 
with somebody from their congregation is uh, a fundamental abuse of power, but it only proves the point that power is an effective relationship. And one of the reasons we give people power over other people, why, one of the reasons we give parents power over children is we, pres we assume a loving relationship. I mean, you can't really affect other people or be affected by them with, without power. So power is not a bad thing. How do you use it? Um, I mean, again, just as a professor, I would never, you know, make up a grade for you that was lower than the one you actually got. I wouldn't sell you an A. I wouldn't blackmail you with an F. I wouldn't, you know, say, if you do this for me, I'll do this other thing for you. That would be corrupt and that would be an abuse of power. I have the power, obviously, to affect your grade. But the reason I have the power, at least theoretically, is that I earn the right to be trusted. Uh, that I'm a professor, I care, um, I, I want to teach, I want to help you guys. Uh, in the same way that a priest or a judge or a general theoretically would say all those same things, but, but power can corrupt. And you've heard the saying, some British lord said this, uh, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So we've, we certainly saw a lot of this with Trump, but... Uh, how do you, is, is, it a, is it a foregone conclusion that power corrupts? I don't, really, I don't think so. I've, I've had a certain degree of power for, for years over uh, students and a number of things at the university and to the best of my knowledge, I've never abused it. And I'm not, I'm not you know, gunning for sainthood here. I, it, that, that should be something that one could expect for people. You don't get a medal for not being corrupt, although lately people act like that. Um, why aren't you praising me for for not cheating or something? Um, they, I mean, a mean, if you're going to have a life that, that seems meaningful, and this is where corruption can sort of hollow people out sometimes, because the more corrupt they get, the more they have to insist that, uh, that they're operating within some kind of moral domain that's, uh, that's acceptable. Um, but the other reason power corrupts is that power shields you from accountability. And insurance companies actually have a word for this. They call it moral hazard. One of the reasons we have deductibles in car insurance, for instance, um, so you might have a thousand dollar deductible, so because they want to make sure that you have some skin in the game, so you so you just couldn't care less if someone plowed into your car or not, because they're going to roll up with a new one the next day, no questions asked. Uh, there, so deductibles are trying to guard against that you'll be accountable. So you might get in an accident. You, someone could bump into you, uh, your attention could be diverted, you could bump into someone else. There, they, there's insurance for that, but you're gonna have to pay the first $1,000. Uh, not so much because it was even your fault, but if you don't have to, you, you'll be a more careful driver. And you'll even be a more careful driver in minor ways, like not just opening your car door and letting it slam into the side of the parked car next to you. Now, there's, there's very little chance anyone will get hurt. So if it does, if none of it matters, um, our tendency to open the door carefully. Now we should do that because because we're not a jerk. But the fact is that people have to be people are jerks, uh, and they think they're more important than everyone else, and they're in they're in a bigger hurry, and what they're doing is more important, and their goals are are more worthy, and the list goes on and on. But the in the end, you're always lesser than this what this other person thinks of themselves, and um, Put you in harm way if they're in harm's way if they have no accountability and excuse me we're going to see this next week when when they start the impeachment um should trump be held accountable for what he did while in office the lever the 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 odd it's not a typical court um because of what they all what impeachment does it has the power to remove you from office because you are a present danger and it's a little bit of a problem because if you're not in office anymore are you a present danger um so there's a, it's a really interesting, I think they should convict him uh, because if he's not, if we're going to say that a president is not responsible for anything they do, as long as they do it close enough to the end of their term that there's not time to impeach them, what the heck are we saying? Two, uh, two weeks with a get out of jail free card to do, do anything. Um, it, you know, that doesn't make any sense either. The moral hazard of that, that, that a president has, would have nothing to lose. Now, obviously a decent president would would not cause destruction just because they won't be held accountable. 
we like to think that people will hold themselves accountable. But in this age of economics, uh, the accountability has almost disappeared. The only accountability is whatever gets imposed on you. It, it, it seems like it doesn't even occur to people anymore that um, can you be accountable for yourself? It's like you say that to people now and they're like, well, why would I do that? I mean, unless somebody catches me, why, why should I pay a fine? And uh, I mean, unless I'm unless they can prove I did it, unless they can stop me, um, there's nothing wrong with doing it. Well, there is there's lots wrong with doing it. When when you remove personal accountability, uh, and people aren't even talking about it anymore, what they typically talk about is can we legally impose accountability on people because they won't impose it on themselves. But we skipped a step there. What happened to imposing it on yourself? What happened to caring about uh, whether what you did was fair, whether it was in your, whether you felt that it was right or wrong. This, this is something we've been going down this rabbit hole since the picture of Dorian Gray, where, where Dorian Gray had no accountability. He put the portrait in the attic. He never got older. He always seemed charming. He could just destroy everybody whenever he wanted, as much as he wanted. It, it's one of the most destructive things you can do to society and, it, and to communities is remove accountability. They, you cannot have a community if nobody's uh, willing to be accountable. And you know the first thing people do now when they get caught red-handed is they hire a dozen lawyers to argue day and night and to, and to attack the, the process, which is what you're going to be seeing uh, the Republicans doing, is that since they don't have a case that, that Trump didn't incite this crowd, they're going to they're going to attack whether Congress has a right to hold the trial. So whenever a criminal has no case, they attack the process. Every defense lawyer um, knows that. Um, and something I had experienced with in another life. But the um, so in the balcony. Well, well, let me go back to to to, to, keep, to look. <laughs> sorry, in the balcony. Power is an effective relationship, and it's. I've talked a lot about self-construction, how we create a sense of coherent self. But but tonight's lecture, I'm trying to add positioning. Where what's your position in relation to the master discourse? Um, I mentioned that. I think I forget now what I've said in open classroom and what I've said in lectures. And and I don't want to say that you that you put yourself at risk if you don't listen to the open classrooms. But I do think. Uh, those are inter interesting discussions happen in the, in the open classroom that I think augment. So I don't think I don't think you have to listen to the open classroom to be reasonably positioned in terms of the midterm. But I do think it could enhance your position. I don't think I'm doing anything in the open classroom that isn't present in the, the notes and in these taped lectures. But there's a liveliness to the discussion. We had a good discussion about the tree and good in Godot. I think two open classes go and and the last op and the open classes have been interesting and they give me a chance based on your own interesting questions to to come up with new angles on the same material so i guess that's the way i would put it so if you need more angles on this material because you're kind of getting it you check either either come to the open classroom or or at least try it out you can fast forward if, if it seems like it's getting slow or, or to some dead space um anyway that's that's just an aside, but one of the things that came up, uh, I think, is, is this concept of interpolation. That, I mean, in, in an ideological world, we're all persuaded that the, of the, what the position is that, that we are in. This is like the movie The Matrix. You know, we get position. So, if you're an example I gave is, is if you're crossing a street at Bloor and Young, and you hear someone shout "Hey," and you and probably other people will turn their heads, and if it's if it's a homeless person shouting at someone who, who didn't give them a loony, everyone will continue on their way. But if it's a policeman in a uniform, everyone's going to have to do a second take, which is, is he talking to me, he or she, to say he for convenience sake. Because if, and because if the cop is, is then also pointing to, to, to you, then you've been interpolated. He doesn't know you. You don't know him. Neither one of you know each other's name. And you, but you know that you have to respond because, he's, because of his uniform. You're interpolated because his subject position is not just somebody else's at the intersection of Bloor and Young. He is represented. He has an entire system behind him. He can arrest you. Now that that you may have to be released if he just doesn't have sufficient cause, but he can arrest you and bring you down to the station. Now, if someone who's not a policeman and not in uniform uh, takes you 
and drags you off to the corner because they want to ask you a question. That's kidnapping. That's assault. So the, so the exact same action, one is sanctioned by the state and, and the other is an offense against the state, even though it's the same action. So, the, so what's your position? The, the policeman has a position of power when a policeman stops your car and says, you know, your, your taillight is out. Um, he's got the power to write you a ticket. That ticket goes to the courts. You have to either show up at court or pay the fine. If you ignore it, the fine will be imposed and, and you'll have to pay it when you try and get your license renewed. So there's, and yet it's not the policeman who will convict you. I mean, one of the, we, what we try and do in a democracy is divide up the power. So you have police who can make arrests, but then you have judges who decide uh, whether, the, whether the arrest was uh, adequate, whether the evidence is enough. And then we have, you know, we have uh, local judges, then we have uh, federal judges, then we have the Supreme Court, uh, which is supposed to be distinct from the presidency and, and from Congress or here in Canada, the parliament. So we divide it up so that, so that nobody has absolute power. Um, and they're ch supposed to be checks and balances. The checks and balances have been off a lot lately, especially in the U.S., because everybody is now ducking accountability as a natural act, not even as there's no sort of public shame anymore. Um, there's a saying, patriotism um, is the uh, last refuge to which a scoundrel clings. And we're certainly seeing that, the patriots. But though, so here's how QAnon happened and here's how the balcony uh, suggests this. The, the important point to remember here is that, that in the balcony, there's a continuous rewriting and rereading uh, of self-construction by the characters in relation to other characters. So the, the balcony is a lot like a chess game where, where characters, keep, they can't change their self-construction, but they can change their position. So the fantasy, you go to the brothel to fantasize that you have a different position. You're not a plumber, you're a bishop. And as a bishop, you would have power over people who came to you to confess and to ask for forgiveness. So the prostitutes come in and where the sexualizing kind of matters is it, it's just a, it's a quick way to show that um, uh, the way that power differential is temp, can tempt you to abuse the power. Like a bishop is supposed to listen to somebody's sins and then give them some penance and say, don't do this again. Um, but if you want to enjoy the power of it, you could, you know, withhold your absolution unless the, unless the penitent did something for you. So you change it, into, you make it transactional and, and abuse the power, like me selling. Just give it, say I'll give you an A plus for $500 or I'll just give you the C plus that you earn, which case I'm not actually ripping you off. Um, or I could go further and say, or I'll give you a D plus and not even the C plus that you earned. And, and clearly you could, there, you have, you can say, well, I can go to the deans and I can go to the chair and that's all true. And, and you might even in the end get, you know, get me fired or something and I would deserve it. But it's hard, it's getting harder and harder to do that. Um, people lawyer up, people say, how do you know? I was, when a woman says she's been raped, the, the questions become what were you wearing? Uh, how late at night was it? How many drinks had you had? Uh, why did you agree to have a date with this guy uh, off a of Tinder? You know, they start going, they start questioning the victim, um, and which is really unfair. But the person, if, if you're turning in someone who's powerful, they, and this is why people often are afraid to do it, they have ways to turn it around on you, to, to get you in jail um, for falsely accusing or whatever else they might make up. So this, this concept of positioning is, is really important. Are you the policeman or are you the person who was crossing the, the crosswalk when you heard someone shout, uh, hey? And we saw this with Black Lives Matter, that the, uh, in the horrible case of George Floyd, um, the abuse of power uh, was horrific. And it was nine minutes long and it was taped and went viral. Um, the policeman was within his limits probably to, uh, to want to arrest uh, George Floyd for questioning whether he actually had passed a counterfeit bill or not. But the kneeling on the neck for nine minutes was, was an attempt to assert absolute power, the power of life and death, the power to execute someone in the street. Um, and since you know, police are given a lot of power because there's an assumption and a, and a, a trust that, that they will use it judiciously. You know, they have guns, they have 
mace, they have uh, nightsticks. Um, and there's reasons for that. And, and in a way they have a right because they're, they're very, their job puts them in danger all the time, puts them in harm's way. So they have to be given power. You can't send them out there with nothing. Although in England, um, police often don't have guns. They have much less, uh, much less death in, in encounters between police and civilians. So there's something to look at there. Uh, but the, the, the reality is that um, when someone in power decides to not limit themselves, they can be extremely destructive because they're already in a position to exert verbal or physical or both. This is this is where verbal abuse in a family is so painful because where are you going to go if you're six and your mother or your father or an uncle is, is shouting that you're worthless and you're never going to amount to anything? Where do you go? Uh, you're you're dependent on being in that house, a job when you're seven. So you you you're at the mercy um, of of because they have a they have a position uh, over you. And there are many cases where when you whistle blow, nobody does anything. Uh, you go to the, the the head of the company and say that your boss is sexually harassing you. They 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 take it all down. They write it all up. They say we're going to be looking into this, and then cricket. And now the person knows you did that and they're making your life even worse and you're wishing you'd never said anything or you just have to quit the job, which is also unfair. Um, but sometimes the the only way because the, the people far, farther up the ladder will don't want to hear it, may pretend to hear it or they may not even do that. But um, you're trapped and, and I've known, I've known plenty of people in my life who had to leave a job that, that they liked because there was no other way to uh, to step out from under the abuse. Um, we're going through this with the governor of Canada right now. Did she create this toxic environment? Lots of people said, I'm not going to judge it. I don't know. But lots of people obviously think so. She herself said, well, no one ever told me. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, I don't know if that's going to play out in courts or not. It's not entirely clear that you commit a crime if you create a quote unquote toxic environment, if it doesn't involve um, physical coercion or physical uh, or, or documented verbal abuse. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the plumber who comes to the balcony to pretend that he's a bishop, all of us, how do we create a, a sense of self and how do we even know who we are in relation to others? Well, we, we feel how we are seen in, in that relationship and that feeling is subjectivity. Um, so, you know, if you, are, if you're dressed inappropriately, let's say for some reason you go into the bank in your bathing suit, you'll probably be allowed, but you're going to get some glances. I mean, you're not, it's not going to, you don't get glances that you wouldn't have gotten if you were fully dressed. They could be disapproving. They could be, um, you know, there could be leering. There could be, it, it, they, but you're going to get gazes. It wouldn't have happened if you were dressed like everybody else. So that's how, I mean, think about rooms you enter where you're comfortable and rooms you enter where you're not, or at least where you're, you know, much more on. Um, you, your subjectivity gets uh, activated by otherness. And even in the case of racism, if there's a black person there, because your subjectivity is based on the fantasy that you're white, because of your fantasy that they're black. I mean, it's just skin color. There's no essence here. You will interpret what they do from a position of paranoia because you've decided black people are dangerous. Um, and one reason you hold on to that belief is that if people are black, then you're white. And certainly, the, in some ways, the QAnon insurrection, the uprising of the capital is this terror that if if black lives matter, um, if we're not allowed to see blacks as lesser than us, well, then how, then how can we assume the privilege of whiteness? Because whiteness is just a position. Blackness is just a position. And neither one exists except in relation to the positioning of the other. This is why clubs for years, you know, black, black people weren't allowed to, to join the golf club. Um, I mean, this goes on all the I'm, they they do it different ways because a lot of it's illegal. But if if a black person can join your, you know, essentially all white country club, then how are you white? It's not if the problem isn't even so much that they're quote unquote black. It's that if they're not black, you're not white. So they have to go because in this club 
you are celebrating your whiteness. Um, and they can be in the club as a waiter uh, and even as a caddy. And, and they can even be well treated because those positions are preordained as subservient. So there's, there's not a challenge. But if they're, if they're a member in equal standing, uh, I saw men's cologne called members only. And I was like, why don't they say cologne for white people? Um, how to smell white. But which, what the hell would that smell like? Uh, but it's like that, this, this presumption of an essence. And, and this has really been quite bad in postmodernism because one of the major crises of our time is we, we don't feel that we are emanating from an essence anymore. We, as I've said, we're very, we're, some of us, me more than most, are aware that, that our essence is a, is a retrospective construction based on a rearrangement of our experience that's underwritten by, um, uh, by an arrangement of our memories. Um, and so I just try and do the best I can with that because people are much more dangerous when they think that they are emanating from an essence and they're much less compassionate and they're much more volatile and reactionary because they're protecting a myth that they that have an inviolable essence and if your inviolable essence is that you're superior to black people because you're white you cannot tolerate um, an incursion into that space by a by a black person and you're also very um, vulnerable to the propaganda of people like Trump saying the reason you don't have a job is Mexicans. Um, the Mexicans took your job. Um, now there's all kinds of inequity in capitalism. So, I, 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 but that that simplicity and, and the, 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 some particular fantasized Mexican took your particular job, um, uh, and it also lets the the people in power off the hook instead of having to adjust the inequities that are that are that are baked into capitalism, uh, particularly late capitalism or, or globalization. Um, you just scapegoat, you, you persuade somebody that uh, it's not the system, it's these others, it's these people over there. They've positioned you as unemployed. And if we got them, and if we build a wall, um, then you can resume your position as employed. So it's very easy to set people against each other from a position of, of, of a higher, of higher power. Uh, Trump could care less what happens to that mob that went up the Capitol steps. They were doing his bidding. They were doing it for him. They said they were called by him. He has, he has no interest in, in their fate um, other than as an homage to his own inflated self-image. Uh, so when we go to see the balcony, in a way, something kind of similar to, uh, to Waiting for Godot happens. And that is that the, there's lots of play acting. There's even a plot of sorts in the balcony. There's a revolution going on and there is a chief of police and he's not, he doesn't go to the brothel to pretend to be somebody else. He goes to the brothel to find out if anybody wants to pretend to be him because our reality is made possible by our fantasies. The way reality you have is, is po only possible because of a fantasy you don't acknowledge. And the plumber knows that. He just wants to pretend to be a bishop because bishops who think they're bishops are just as wrong as that plumber thinking he's a bishop. Nobody is a bishop. Nobody is a professor. I'm someone in a position called professor, but, but my, I'm, when people say, you know, I'm, I'm not being, a professor is not what I am. Once again, a professor is a part of what I do is doing. And we're so phobic about being because it feels like the void that we constantly want to conflate what we do with who we are. But what I'm doing tonight, talking to you, is not who I am. It's in, there's an, it's an aspect of who I am. Um, and, but because what I do has a degree of power, being the, being the professor, being the, the, uh, the head of, of, of a department or a class or a program, all, all of those things, it's even more tempting to think, oh yeah, no, I am a professor. And, and if, when people say things like, what do you do? You can, uh, you, I can say, uh, I can say I'm a professor, which is kind of wrong. What I should really say is I, uh, if you mean how do I make money, I profess. Um, uh, and then behind that, because my being a professor, quote unquote, is, my rearrangement of all that's real into a very specific and, and uh, constricted reality. And of course, I can't be 
a professor all the time, and I don't necessarily feel like a professor walking home after this tape uh, through the streets. Um, although if somebody saw me, they'd, they'd say, oh, that's Professor Leonard, you know, this. But, um, and there are certain spaces where I'm well known and I can see everyone sees my position. And I don't mind that, but I don't mistake that for who I am because there are other rooms I can enter where nobody has a clue who I am and they've never read anything that I write or, or talk about. Um, and they wouldn't be interested uh, if, if, if I did. So I always, you know, always have to remember that. I mean, I've had people say, come up to me and say, oh, it's, it's an honor to meet the greatest James Joyce scholar in the world, meaning me. And I'm like, uh, kind of embarrassed. And I say, I sort of, and I say, thanks, but, and I can see their admiration. And, but part of me is also thinking, how many people have ever even heard of James Joyce? Um, I mean, uh, yeah, if you, if you're just spending your life on Joyce, you probably know who I am. That doesn't make me the king of the world. Um, it's, it's a, it's a small niche, but a president who thinks he's a president is just as insane as, as a plumber who thinks he's a president. Trump wasn't a president. He occupied the office, the apparatus, the constitution that allowed him to perform the function of a president. And his insisting it was a fake election and he wasn't going to go was, was his attempt to say, um, I'm bigger than the apparatus. I'm the apparatus that allowed me to perform the function of the presidency is I'm taking it apart and then I'll be a dictator. There won't be any apparatus that conduct, that confers on me the honor of serving the people as a president. I don't, I don't think it occurred to Trump even once that he was a public servant. Um, or, or, or that he'd, you know, he'd been sent there by the people uh, to to work for them. I mean, he says, he, at least to his own, because he was very specific about it. He only wanted to even claim to work for people who voted for him. He was one of the first presidents to to basically say after taking office, if, if you didn't vote for me, too bad, because I'm not doing anything for you. And the typical thing, which Biden has already done, is I'm going to work for you even if you didn't vote for me, um, because I'm the president of everybody. Uh, yeah, there was, you know, we had an election, lots of people didn't vote for me, but now that I won, we're all Americans. Trump never did that uh, and, and, and never will. So, uh, so a subject position is different from a self because a subject position is a position one finds oneself in, in relation to others. Vladimir and Estragon have subjected themselves to Godot. They've taken a subject position. We are waiting for Godot. And on the one hand, in taking that subject position, they give up their power. They give away their power. They give away their rights. But in return, they're given a steady function. What, what, who are you? I'm someone who waits for Godot. He's coming. He said he was coming. Well, not today. Okay, I'll come back tomorrow. This is what QAnon did. Trump was coming. The Illuminati was going to be exposed. Uh, the, the, the pedophilia coming out of pizza parlors would happen. And, you, and, and when you look at the Twitter traffic, and I, and I put this in the discussion section, the word waiting comes up constantly um, in the chat rooms. You know, they're talking to each other saying, I'm oh, God, I'm getting tired of waiting. I thought it was going to happen today. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, you know, Pence is now confirming the electoral votes. That wasn't supposed to happen. Trump was, is, it's, was not supposed to to have to leave. And, and then you see some of them scrambling to say, well, I think Biden's working for him. And they worked it out that it was that Trump could do more by behind the scenes. And so Biden is a proxy president that Trump and his ultimate power has put into the, the former place so that he can operate now in secret. And he's still the president of the president. You can't stop the patterns like that. You can't prove a negative. Um, I can say, I can say you can't prove that aliens have never visited Earth. You can't prove that I'm not an alien. Um, so when you get people into when you start challenging people to prove a negative, you really have to just call them on it and say, why are you asking me to prove a negative? It's impossible. Because if you try and prove a negative, you start to sound defensive. And it lets the other person say, ha, uh huh, uh huh. Um, very obnoxious uh, uh, strategy. But so they position themselves uh, in, in this passive relationship to Godot, which makes them feel more secure. Like, let's just wait for Godot. It's safer that way. They don't have to take responsibility for making choices. Um, 
And so that that most political line in Godot is when Estrogen asks if, if they still have rights, and uh, Vladimir says we gave them away. And Hozo was, Hozo was that unlucky for his sense of power. He positioned, and still is in Act One at least, is still trying to position Lucky as his servant, as his slave, which makes him the master because Lucky's the slave. But really, the master is also the slave of the slave because if the slave either rises up or in some form refuses to become a slave, then, then the master can no longer be a master. It's the same thing as the black white. That's why we live in such a binary world because everybody is scrabbling for traction, leverage, positioning over um, other people. Um, and uh, but but, but so it's out of luck because uh, Lucky's he's he's broken Lucky by by positioning him so hard, uh, not for Lucky's sake, um, but for his own you know kind of hopeless um, attempt to make himself uh, coherent and powerful at all times and and never insecure about anything, and Lucky is unable to establish a position at all. That's what we see in his monologue, the constant slippage. And it drives the other people crazy because they they realize they're all, we're all lucky on a certain level. I mean, we're, we're all this character lucky, but except most of us, most of the time, are able to make our monologue make sense enough to us, us and to others that we can maintain our position. Some gear, the gears are stripped in lucky. He can't hold a position. Um, and so he has none, which means he has no subjectivity. He has no relationship to others. And all he can do is talk in circles. So uh, being a bishop is not being at all. It's, it's a sort of a, a, a static form of doing while pretending it is a, a, the essence of your being. Um, so the poor goes to the brothel to fake being a bishop becomes one, in fact, later to help overthrow the revolution. Because the rebels succeed in blowing up the castle. They kill the queen, they kill the bishop, they kill the general. And all of a sudden this weirdo called the envoy shows up. He's my favorite character because he's, I'm pretty much the envoy. I'm the one who explains to you how meaning gets made. The envoy doesn't think anything means anything either. The envoy could teach this class. He is a master of symbolic construction. He believes in nothing um, and and knows that everything is illusion, that, uh, that reality is an illusion. Um, and so he won't answer a question that's just straightly, like the chief of police says, is the queen dead? Is, is she in the castle? And he says, the queen is in the castle and she's not. The queen is embroidering and she is not. And, and embroidering comes up a lot with the envoy because he's basically saying, you know, what is a sweater except a strategic collection of string, right? Or even this jacket that I'm wearing is string. It's just been knotted, so it looks like a jacket. It's not a jacket. We call it a jacket, but it's just string in the shape of a jacket. Um, and uh, that's what the envoy is always aware of. He's always looking at the matrix, the, the, the things behind what we call things. So he would look at this jacket and say that I was wearing string and that I am wearing a jacket and I am not wearing a jacket, which is kind of true. Um, that, so, and the, so the chief of police is like, what the hell are you talking about? But the envoy knows that, that he can just grab, gather up this plumber and, and, and as long as they march through the street in the costumes that they wear in the brothel, the populace won't be able to tell. It won't even occur to the populace that they're not the bishop, the general. Uh, I've made this joke before, but how do you know I'm a teacher? How do you know I have a PhD? You haven't seen my credentials. I could be someone just trying to get off the street and stay warm. Uh, doing these tapes. Um, and, uh, you know, someone knows I have credentials. I got hired. You don't know I got hired, but I did. And in, and in the process of getting hired, they knew I had a PhD. I had to do lectures and I had to do classrooms and 200 people applied for the job that I got. Uh, so I was, gra I was scrabbling for position with 200 other people. All, all wanted the job that I, that I had. So I killed them all. No, I'm kidding. I'm just saying that that's where power, power can go that far. I can kill anyone. I, I simply impress the University of Toronto more, more than any of them. Um, and then they gave me the position. Um, and then once I had the position, uh, it's like the, the sperm, you know, once one sperm gets into the egg, the egg instantly becomes impenetrable probably most of the time, unless you have 
twins and stuff. But most of the time, the second sperm that hits the eggs out of luck. The first sperm that gets there wins. And then, boom, that sperm has And now it's the zygote. And now it's the beginning of a baby, and it's a fetus. And the other sperms are done. They're, there's nowhere to go. Um, they suddenly um, have no purpose. That is it, you know, for a while there, I don't know how many sperm there are, I forget my sex ed class, but let's say there's a couple million. And in an instant, one is essential. And the other couple million lose their purpose in one second because the eggs closed up. Boom. And in a funny way, getting a job is a little like that. Someone says, okay, um, you know, Dr. Leonard, we'd like to offer you the job. And I say, oh, good, I'd like to take the job. Those other 199 people just swim off. Redundant sperm. Um, I don't know how far I want to take that metaphor. But anyway, so one is powerful only in relation to those who are not. Power is not an inherent force. Power is an effective relationship. You know, imagine if someone said to you, by the way, you're going to drive down the street. A cop's going to stop you the car, the siren, all of it. He's going to write you a ticket. Don't worry, it's not a real cop. He's my friend. We're doing, we're, we're doing a movie or something. This is a, it's not a ticket. You can just throw it out. And uh, and so then the whole time we were, if this were the case, the whole time we watched the cop, the quote unquote cop, write the ticket, we'd feel more powerful because the ticket is, is a piece of paper. Now, even when a real cop writes you a real ticket, it's still on a piece of paper. But now it's not just a piece of paper. Um, it, it, because a duplicate of it's going to get filed away in, in another place where you're going to be held accountable for, for what this ticket says the cops saw you doing. Um, but that paper is worthless unless it's a connection to the law, the court, fines, penalty, penalties, jail terms. And we see this in the judge and the thief. And, uh, there's the bishop and the sinner, and then, and then there's the judge and the thief. And at one point, the judge starts to get nervous and, and says, did you really steal all these things? And because if you didn't, then I'm not a, a, I'm not a real judge. Obviously, he isn't a real judge. He knows he's not a real judge, but it's, and he can't he keeps flipping back and forth. I'm like, tell me you didn't really steal all that stuff. And she's like, no, I'm not going to tell you that because then you're going to complain to the madam that 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 I screwed up the, the scenario here that you're that you're paying for. And, uh, you know, and then and so the, the judge doesn't know which he wants in a way. Like he doesn't want to be responsible as a plumber or whatever he is for this woman going out and stealing things because she could get arrested and go to jail. I don't think she stole these things. I think they're props. He, I think he knows that. But they're play acting and they're role playing. And he, and he keeps snapping back and forth between the role play as the bishop and then the nervous plumber um, who doesn't want her to get into trouble. But inside the role play of, of the judge, he also says, how can I be a perfect judge if you're not a perfect thief. And then she gets a kind of coy look on her face and says, maybe I, maybe I didn't steal them. And he's like, don't say that. Please don't say that. She's like, Neil. And he's like, okay, fine. And he, he crawls over and licks her shoe. And, and, and the, the power is, is completely flipped. All of a sudden, she's the master um, because she's threatening to, to not be a thief. The great poet William Blake said, um, churches are built with the bricks of uh, sorry, sorry, Blake said brothels are built with the bricks of religion and prisons are built with the bricks of law. So there, in a way, there's no brothels if there's no religion, there's no jails if there's no judges, there's no crime if there's no criminals. This is, this is all an effect of, uh, uh, of binaries. So the relig religion will act as if it has nothing to do with sexuality, even though it, it, it tends to constrain it. In, in most most religions, and I'm not saying good or bad, I mean, uh, they have an attitude toward what's what is sexually permissible and what isn't, and that that creates an interest in the taboo. So it is it's not what religions set out to do, but by forbidding things, religions make them more erotic. Uh, by saying that's something you shouldn't do, they set up the possibility of going somewhere and fantasizing to, that you're doing it. Or and this is how pornography operates too. It, forbidden scenarios that, that even the people who uh, who buy the pornography don't want to do it in real life. They want to look at it. They want to watch a scenario maybe where it's done. But, but usually, unless you cross over into a kind of um, sadomasochism for real, you, you don't want to do the things 
you're willing to fantasize about. Because one, the, the point of fantasizing about the things is not because you want to do them. It's because you want you know, that those fantasies underwrite the coherency of your reality. And as such, it's important that you not do them. Doing, you know, trying to actualize your fantasies is, is dangerous because fantasies are the foundation of your reality. It's better that they stay fantasies and that, that way, the frustration that you might have in not actualizing your fantasy is gives you the drive to actually um, take advantage of your reality. It's what Freud called sublimation, where you, you, given that you can't do whatever you want to anybody, uh, you, you, you get a job, you teach a class, you take a class, um, you build a, a model ship, whatever, you sublimate, you take that excess energy um, that you're, or, or you can you can become an abusive person and you can go out and abuse people every time you feel that excess. But civilization is built on sublimation. Um, so sexual frustration or forbidding, you know, even things like the incest taboo are there. There, they, there's lots of reasons to have an incest taboo, but some of them are quite functional. Like without an incest taboo, um, there's no there's no drive to connect with other families with other. Uh, communities. Um, there's no drive, which is also potentially a, a paternal figure can can keep all of the available uh, partners to himself, um, and uh, society would break down. So, in some ways, society is built on the incest taboo because it gets that's where it gets its energy through sublimation. Uh, that's that's what Freud was talking about with the Oedipal complex. You, as, a, as a child, you can't have your mother as your sexual partner, and you you worry that you can't defeat the father or what will take revenge on you. All that's all this energy, and so what you really got to do is get out of the house and go find your own partner. And the the, the, the all those those tensions are productive. There's, they can, but they can easily go wrong too. But they're when they go right, for want of a better word, it gives the drive to go out and make your own life. Um, so the, the judge consents to lick the feet of the thief uh, when, when she threatens to stop pretending. Because as in his quote, if you are not a proper thief, I am not a proper bishop. So in this sense, the prostitute has more power since uh, she doesn't care about this scenario. His pretending to be a bishop does nothing whatever for whatever ideal image it is that she imagines when she imagines herself. Her, her reality is elsewhere. That's why she's getting paid. She's working. He's fantasizing. This is not her fantasy. Other people often uh, are, are solicited to work so that one can fantasize. I mean, you know, if you look at tourist posters, you know, come to the Bahamas and then they show you the hot tub and all the people who are going to bring you your drinks with the little umbrellas in them and you can fantasize yourself a king for a week at this all expense paid resort. Um, so, you know, and Carmen's interesting. She's the accountant for Irma, a former prostitute. And, and she has a daughter in the, in the country with a garden, or so she says. But at a certain point, Irma is saying, you know, you're not different than men. You have, you, you, maybe you have a daughter, maybe she's in a garden. Um, and, and, but you're, even if you do have a daughter in a garden, you're using them. As as a, as an anchoring point, so that you can tolerate being here. So they are they're still underwriting uh, your reality. In the same way, you might fantasize that the fact that you have a, a new Porsche um, anchors your identity, uh, and you're actually, you're anxious to be seen in the Porsche, or if not, to tell people you have one, uh, or wear a Rolex. It's, it's kind of a portable fantasy. Uh, people know they're worth ten thousand dollars. Somehow. You you knew uh, you had enough money for that. It was an interesting case with Biden was seen as wearing a Rolex. Uh, and so this was kind of tweeted against him that, oh, you, you, you claim to be such a populist and here you are with your Rolex. But it belonged to his son who died of cancer, um, Beau Biden. And so he's wearing his son's watch in memory of his son. It, it was just goes to show how you can, you're, you're, can get the wrong reality. I mean, people were convinced. I mean, how could they not be convinced? He's wearing a $10,000 Rolex. He's a hypocrite. He's claiming to want to help everyone out. And he's just wearing a big, fat, expensive watch. And they were just wrong. And the reality was wrong. QAnon's reality is wrong. It doesn't matter if your reality is wrong, if you believe it. Um, and usually we double down in our belief on our reality when other people uh, challenge it. And one of the things that was most effective about creating QAnon 
um, is that the QAnon people were given things to look for, which in a way had already been planted. So for instance, uh, some of the conspiracists said, you know, that there was this particular um, hand gesture, which I don't even know how to do, that, that was a sign of, of, of belonging to a satanic cult. And then they would have pictures of Lady Gaga or people who use their hands a lot, <laughs> Mick Jagger. It's not hard if you pour through enough images to find Mick Jagger doing this or something that looks like it. So first they would just post all this stuff. Um, and then after a while, people started finding it on their own. And that's the point where people are, where they're the chief of police want people to be, that he's told them that he's all powerful. And after a while, they feel like they've discovered it. Because if you plant evidence in such a way that, that the person thinks they've discovered it, you don't have to convince them of its truth because the fact that they think they discovered it will be proof of its truth, even though you planted it there for them to discover, which means they didn't discover it. That is the essence of QAnon. It's like they suddenly they saw the, the, the symbol of the Illuminati and the star that, that Melania Trump put on top of the Christmas tree. It was just a damn star. And then they were so excited and, and then they shared this and then they got all these, all this praise like, oh, good one, you know, let's put, wow, it's even on the star of, uh, of, of Melania. And they began to worry about Melania and, uh, or something along those lines. So, and no wonder they had that QAnon shaman guy who, who looked like he'd escaped from the legend of Zelda, uh, some sort of cosplay uh, revolutionary. And he's standing on the balcony, you know, baying at the moon, sort of, while the others are ruffling around and they're looking, what are they looking for? They don't know what they're looking for, but it's like, where's the next clue? It's a, it, it's a video game. They're all avatars and they've gone into a room and they didn't know what to do because they couldn't find a key. You know, it's like when you play those games, and you go in a room and there's a door and it won't open because the key is, is under a rock somewhere. And, and uh, you can tell I play really sophisticated games. I don't play them at all. And I haven't paid attention to them since my kids were little and they had those easy Zelda games. We had to find the flute or whatever, or you couldn't swim. I don't remember all the details, but the video games operate this way. I mean, we, really what QAnon was, was it took the video game out of, off the screen and and storming the Capitol was the final boss fight. Um, and when they had breached the Capitol, they were done. Uh, they had won the game, um, except that then it must have slowly started to occur to them that they're in the Capitol. They're not in their basement in, in some pixelated virtual reality of having stormed the Capitol. They're in the Capitol. They have trespassed, they've committed a felony. They can go to jail, like they can go to jail, not their avatar. And, and also, if you die, you don't respawn. I, don't th I think half the people, they didn't seem to quite understand that. They didn't think anyone was going to get hurt. Or, or if they did get hurt, they just have to go back to the beginning of the game and, and, and respawn. I'm, I mean, I'm so sh amazed at, I think this has snuck up on me, that, that we are in a video game world. I, maybe we're already out of the age of economics and into the, into the age of, of algorithms, which is a form of economics. But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, maybe I'll say that in a couple of years. But for now, I'm going to stick with the age of economics. But I do want to just put that avant-garde idea out there that, that, we have, that video games are starting to seem more real than reality. Um, there, was a, there was a cartoon in The New Yorker where uh, so there's a boy, you know, maybe he's 10, and he's, he's looking out the window to the yard, and he's touching the window. And the mother explains to the other mother, he thinks it's a touch screen, <laughs> which is kind of a, a horrific, you know, he's like, he's trying to move the tree around, right? Because he'd been playing with his iPad for so long. And if you want to move a tree, you, you click on it and, and slide your finger and the tree, the tree moves. What, what if, why can't, why can't that be our reality? Why not say that reality is a video game and that, and that video games are real? I and mean, why do we play video games today? Because they impose a pattern on chaos both in the game and, and the fact that we've, you know, uh, been sitting in a basement for eight hours playing a game doesn't necessarily mean that eight hours of reality passes by. Um, and playing a video game is a lot like waiting for Godot uh, because you're, you're occupied. Um, I mean, I don't know what Vladimir and Estragon would do if they had uh, iPhones and, and they could play Tetra. Would they be okay? You know, May, they'd be, it would, yeah, because it would distract them from 
the, their awareness of being to, to keep playing candy cane or farm animals or whatever those Facebook little games were uh, as well. Um, so the balcony's thematic and structural masquerade trap the audience in a car, in the audience, you and me watching the play in a world where at one and the same time, everything is theatrical and nothing is. This play makes us very aware how much of our reality is role play, how much of being feminine is role play, how much of being masculine is role play. Uh, whether we know it or not, we role play as masculine so that other people can role play as feminine. It doesn't even matter which biological body you have. Men can uh, role play as, as women. Uh, clearly, women can role play as, as masculine. Um, you see it in the perfume and cologne ads, that the perfume ads offer to be a prop for your performance of femininity. The cologne ads offer to be a prop for your unacknowledged performance of masculinity. Because men aren't supposed to know that being masculine is an act. They need women to help blind them to the degree to which they're acting their masculinity. Which is, this is why, you know, women, when they're taught to be feminine, they're like, don't talk about yourself, get him to talk about himself. Your job is to get him to think he's the only one important enough to talk, uh, or, or the, you know, there's this issue of uh, asking a, if a woman asks a man to open a jar of mayonnaise or or spaghetti sauce, and does it in public, everybody stops. It's like clear the room. This woman just asked me to open a jar. I'm a man. I'm either going to open this jar, or I'm going to die trying, because if I can't open this jar. And it's not, if you open, if you picked up the jar as a guy and couldn't get it open, but you weren't asked by a woman, it's okay. But if a woman asks you and you can't do it, then you have to turn in your mask. Sorry. Um, and so it's terrifying. And, uh, you know, if you really want to you know, get revenge on a guy, then just super glue the lid on the jar and hand it to him at a party. If you're a woman and say, hi, honey, could you open this? And you'll destroy it. Um, I mean, I don't know how much I'm joking about that. But anyway, we need the concept of fantasy to maintain the concept of reality. We need the fantasy of being masculine or feminine to maintain the reality that we're a man or a woman or even a person. And a fantasy remains such only as long as we believe it is one and no longer. The rebels in, in the balcony are as fake as the officials they seek to overthrow. And there, in turn, is fake as the rebels. At the ending of the play reveals that the head of the rebels wanted to overthrow the chief of police, not to replace him, but to become him. When Roger's revolution fails, he finally shows up. And the, who's the first person who wants to fantasize that he's a chief of police? The former head of the rebels who has failed. And what does he do when he goes in there to pretend to be the chief of police? He castrates himself in a, in a kind of... And, the, and the, the chief of police is watching this from the surveillance booth, and he literally reaches down to check himself. And he's like, well, I'm still intact. And, you know, Roger's kind of, in a way, he's kind of lost it. He wants to be the chief of police. And since he can't be the chief of police, he makes the mistake of thinking, I'll become the chief of police, and then I'll cut off my power, I'll castrate myself, and that will destroy this chief of police that I was unable to become. But he's, you know, obviously deluded, but it's too late. The chief of police is now a symbol of power and not, uh, uh, it doesn't, he can't just pretend to be the chief of police and cut, uh, castrate himself and, and um, cut off his power. It shows how, pay, how much power is, you know, predicated on male anatomy. This, all this stuff about, you know, people are constantly saying, have some balls if you're going to do this or you're going to do that. And we have to have all buildings and every city is trying to have a taller building than than other cities um, and size matters or whatever else they, they go on and on about this one bit of male appendage which distinguishes a male body from a female body as though it were a source of power and that just shows what a what a fantasy power is because that's in fact the most vulnerable part of the male body uh, and it's presented as the toughest one that, that, that if you're a tough person that's that's where things are tough. That, that's the most vulnerable. Anyone who's been played soccer and been kicked there knows uh, that is the last place that you, it is the most vulnerable to pain if it gets kicked. So it's kind of absurd that we use that piece of, anat uh, uh, of anatomy to, as, a, as an equivalent of indomitable power. Uh, that says much more about the fantasy of being masculine than, than about the, the anatomy of 
uh, of the male body. Um, so let's see, I want to, I'm skipping through some other notes I just jotted down earlier today. Uh, see if I can get to them because I know I want to wrap things up pretty soon. Uh, because all humans, and I, think I still have to plug this in because I'm at 20% or something. Hold on. Ah, I'm running out of power, which is ineffective with this thing is plugged in. So all humans seek relief from the fragmented body images through words. We use words to try and stitch together our fragmented body image, not our literal body, but our image of ourselves as complete and unified, which we never are. Language promises to unify us and it, and it, it assures us that we will always be self-alienated because the world is not the word and the word claims to be the world and we allow that just like we allow Godot. Godot is a fantasy that the word and the world could become the same and, 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 and Godot can never, that can never arrive, but it can always be presented as a possibility um and we long for it we long for, you know trump seems says i am the world um i i control the world with with words doesn't matter what he says most of the time he doesn't make any sense he's virtually incoherent but he's presented himself as somebody who can uh bridge the gap between the world and the word so which means then that he can change everybody's experience because he knows what's wrong he's the only one who can fix it and he knows where it is and and how it has to be fixed um, so alienated and we're alienated and fragmented in the world of words. Words are signifiers. The things that they signify are signified. And we are lost in between the gap of the signifier and the signified in between our sense of ourselves as fragmented and our fantasy of ourselves as coherent. And that's life. That's desire. That's what makes us talk. It makes us want things. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a chronically incomplete thing. And, and one of the problems with modernity is it's come up with all these myths that we can close the gap between the signifier and the signified. And if we haven't, it's because we fail. And so we're in an age of anxiety and depression because we, everything we work ourselves into a frenzy to close the gap because we've been told it's possible, but it's not. Learn to live with your gap. Uh, maybe that's why I've always been amused by that clothing store called The Gap, The Void, you know, buy some khakis um, to protect yourself from the, the void or the gap. So men masquerade as active ideals while the women play at being passive slaves to the ideal image of, of being active. You see this with the cologne perfume ads. The masculine because the masculine colon is very active and the gazes are very powerful. The women are always posing and looking off into the sunset. And, and the perfumes are called opium and beauty and masquerade. And the colognes are called granite and brute and rock hard. Whatever. <laughs> Maybe there's someone called that, but there probably will be. Um, so language is power to name, even as it becomes the root cause of the subject's inadequate feelings. It provides the imagined gateway for our subject's return to what has always been, always will be uh, an imaginary component. So Janae's characters willingly forfeit their everyday identities in order to focus on their ideal images. And they want to experience these ideals in solitude. Here's a quote from the play. I want to be a general in solitude, not even for myself, but for my image and my image for its image and so on. But you cannot be your ideal image in solitude because you need otherness to authenticate the fantasy of your ideal so it, it's it's a little like lucky speech it's going to keep collapsing in on itself and, and it's better to know that than to either blame everybody for refusing to authenticate your ideal or for driving yourself around the bend because you keep failing to be your ideal you are going to keep failing to be your ideal that's what it is to be human uh as it says in another play fail again fail better not succeed nobody succeeds we fail better. And that's the best we can hope for. Failures, not only is failure an option, it's the only option. This whole thing, whenever they say failure is not an option, success is, is a myth. Success is a, is a constructed pause. Like let's say you graduate with a 4.0. I absolutely congratulate you. That is a success within the spectrum, but, it, but time just keeps moving right on. And the problem with 
uh, living by our successes is that we can set up a situation where we die by our failures. And neither the, neither a success nor a failure should kill you, so to speak. Um, we are failing all the time. The question isn't, how do I succeed? It's, how do I feel better? Um, so the, the last part of the play is kind of fascinating because after the bishop and everybody goes back to the palace and become the people they only used to fantasize being, and Carmen gets, uh, not Carmen, uh, Chantal gets shot immediately because she had become the, the symbol of the revolution uh, and she has to be eliminated if, if the symbol of the queen is going to be restored. Um, but there's a new Chantal by the end of the play. There's a new rebellion starting. The machine gun fire starts again at the end of the play. So now the formerly fake queen, bishop, and general, and judge, who are now the real ones, are now being attacked again as, as the real ones and might again be defeated unless some new plumbers show up to pretend to be them. So the politics is fantasy, that, that power is driven by fantasy. We fantasize our position. We fantasize the positions of others. Um, and um, so the signifier is always already uh, beyond reach. We're basically, we're sorry, the signified is always beyond reach. We're a bunch of signifiers walking around looking for a signified. Godot is the fantasy of a signified, the ultimate signified, to which all signifiers could then, uh, you know, announce loyalty. Trump poses as a signified. He's not even a very coherent signifier, but he poses as the signified to everyone else's signifiers, and therefore he poses as Godot. Uh, and people will keep waiting for him to, to make them feel like a signified, too. And he promises to do that. And he says, you'd already be a signified, but those other signifiers, the Mexicans, the Jews, the Democrats, they won't let you be a signified. I'm fighting to let you be a signified like me. I want you to be a signified like me. He's not a signified. Nobody is. In fact, he is one of the more spectacular failures. Um, and he has destroyed so much in his pursuit. Um, and, and he is a weird Dorian Gray in the way he persuades other people to destroy their careers and go to jail. Uh, trying to do what he says so that he will uh, he'll admit them into the sacred hall of being the signified, being the tree and not just the word tree. So um, moving toward the end of this, um, the client loves what he sees in the mirror because it reflects what he wants to be seen. Now, Lacan was a friend psychoanalyst, he called this the mirror stage. That when a child sees their coherent reflection <clears throat> in a mirror, they don't feel as coherent as that image, but they want to. And then you can get, you can go into a sort of form of self-alienation where you are now trying to shore up the fantasy that you're as coherent as your image in the mirror, which you can never be, but now you become impatient and even afraid of your own fragmentation. Instead of recognizing it as an inevitability, you you experience it as a liability, something you have to um, correct. And this, this makes us very much uh, victims of commodity culture because the commodity culture ends up saying, well, you just need a new deodorant to look like that image in the mirror. You, you need a new bra, you need a new hairdo, you need a new lipstick that doesn't wear off and it's waterproof. and uh, like that I, I, lipstick called infallible, which is, you know, pretty much God. So God's lipstick. Um, so the client, and this is what these men are trying to do. The, the, the prostitutes for money are agreeing to be mirrors of the ideal, fantasized ideal cells of, uh, of the bishop. There's a, the, the fake facts that we've been living with um, is, and I urge you whether you're going to do the extra point or not to read my article on uh, if ever it was there was because it's a discussion. I wrote it a month before Trump got elected and the editor who took it, the piece said, well, there's, there's no way he's going to get elected, but we're going to run your piece anyway because it's, you know, it seems important. And they even introduced in, in the in the editor's column of the journal, they said, by the time you read this, um, Hillary Clinton will be president. However, Gary Leonard's uh, critique and anatomy of, of how Trump has generated himself larger than life is well worth reading as a, as a piece of media studies. Um, but in fact, Trump won. And I didn't go so far in that article as saying Trump's going to win. 
But I was, to be honest, I was one of the few in print who said, I don't know why you're counting this guy out. Because from what I know of generating, of manipulating the, the, the fantasy, the unacknowledged fantasy that is at the base of everybody's reality, this guy is a Wizard of Oz. And the question is, are we going to be Dorothy or are we going to be Toto? I mean, are we going to go do what this guy says, kill the witch? Uh, or are we going to look behind the curtain? and see that this, you know, he, he wouldn't show his tax returns back then. He still hasn't, they, they finally were shown. He's, they, I, I pay, you know, I don't know, 50 times more tax than Donald Trump. Uh, and somehow that, but it's too late, that whole QAnon thing that he can do no wrong. It's unbelievable how, how bad, how much the curtain has been pulled back on this guy. And he, they, they will, people will not turn their eyes from the apparatus that makes him look like the Wizard of Oz. They will not, stop insisting he's good though because by now there are there are identities and they're they they don't think they can survive going back to the insecurities of wondering who they are where they are why they are when they are all of that was, was resolved for them through the fantasy of uh of trump and uh you know, i love the photographers in late in the in the play because they are they're expert manipulators of reality and the bishop thinks he knows how to pose like a bishop i mean he spent his life posing as a bishop the photographer couldn't care less. it's like stop posing at, at what a bishop is supposed to look like i have to take the photograph i know what a photograph of a bishop is supposed to look like uh, as far as the people are concerned and then they take the monocle of uh that, that was in the, i think the judge and, and they give it to the bishop and tell him to pretend it's a communion wafer to to, to put on the tongue of someone else so the the apparatus is completely interchangeable and then the photographer knows how to handle props and and he mentions at one time that they, they needed a photograph of a prisoner trying to escape so they gave some money to a prisoner and asked him to go get some cigarettes and as he was uh walking off to get the cigarettes they took him in the back and killed him and they took a picture of him being shot in the back and then the caption in the newspaper was uh prisoner trying to flee um that's what QAnon did it's like people would show QAnon a picture of a man being shot in the back and say this is the prisoner escaping no it's some guy who was asked to go buy cigarettes so that he could be killed in a manner that would look like he was a prisoner escaping and that's been happening for four years um these this we're being told that we, that we have discovered for ourselves a reality that has already been constructed by uh someone else um and so the ending of the uh, of the balcony, um, Irma uh, exerts Janae's final blow against society and its privileging of representational ideology and directly addressing the audience as she would a client uh, who had come to a brothel. In other words, you and I are suddenly at her brothel. She breaks the fourth wall and she says to me or to you, you must now go home where everything, you can be quite sure, will be falser than here. You must go now. You'll leave by the right through the alley. So in a way, she winds up saying, your life's a video game. And this play is, is, was, is actually what you saw here. We played out the, the, the dynamic of how you underwrite your reality with your fantasies. So you can go back home now and say you're a professor or say you're a student. But that is not even as real as this play, because this play at least shows you the gears behind that. So this play is more real than reality. So is Godot. Godot is more meaningful than things that claim to mean something, because it's actually about meaning. And the the balcony as a play is, is, is more real than reality, because it's about how we generate reality. It's, it takes us behind the scenes. Uh, all right. I think that's all I got um, for now. So uh, read my notes, uh, watch this tape, read The Balcony, come to open class on 11 with 11 on Wednesday with your uh, with your questions. Um, send me any, any anything more immediate than that. Send it to Leonard DeGarry at hotmail.com. Um, you can ask me a question through through Quirk is it does go to my email now. I've kind of hooked that up, but it's just, you can also just go directly to the email. I posted a bunch of extra credits. You have some fun with that. Don't worry about it if you don't have time. 
they're extra credit. They're not, they're not deductions. They're due, by the way, at the same time as the midterm. So you've still got uh, some time and that's when they'll be because they're extra points for the midterm. So, so if you do them, you'll get the point added, but that's also why they're due at the same time as the midterm because they, they can't come in after the midterm and I'll have more of a few more extra credits for um, the final. Um, but uh, yeah. All right. So that's, that's it for me for now. Uh, I hope this helps you make sense of a remarkable play. And uh, maybe I'll see you for those of you who are in my film class, I will be here Monday night at 730. Also with an open classroom to talk about. Pretty Woman, uh, The Graduate, it happened one night. Good night.